All right, so it's four or five. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know this is the last talk of the day, and everybody's eager for beer 30, so I promise I will not run long. Uh, this is owning Microsoft Outlook with PowerShell. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Andrew Cole. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Culmination. Uh, I am currently a content developer and CE uh, instructor for Chiron Technology Services Information Operations Team. It's fancy talk where we teach people how to break things and hack things. Um, I also do security research part time. Um, in a previous life, I was a military intelligence systems maintainer and integrator. I was a cryptologic network warfare specialist um, and a journeyman interactive operator for the U.S. Army out of Fort Meade. Um, so, did a lot of fun, different, breaky things. Um, I've talked at a couple different places, a bunch of B-sides, NOLACON, uh, and the National Security Agency. That's all that's exciting about me in any way, shape, or form. So I need to throw out a couple of uh, obligatory thank yous. First of all, my boss for actually paying me to do this. That's always a wonderful thing. And second of all, B-sides for letting me come and talk. It's always cool to do the inaugural run of a new conference. Um, and some PowerShell props I got to throw out there. First off, Ed Wilson, Microsoft scripting guy. Um, I borrowed little snippets of code from him here and there, and uh, we always give him credit for it. Um, and also uh, Matt Nelson, who's uh, with Veris Group's uh, Adaptive Threat Division. Um, he wrote a piece of code that inspired me to do a lot of what I did in this talk. Okay, so why Outlook and why PowerShell? Um, quite frankly, why not? Um, I'm pretty sure everyone here probably uses Outlook at work. You probably have Windows 7 or newer for your computers. So that means that I, Outlook's going to be installed on the box. PowerShell version 2 or newer is going to be on the box by default. So everything that I need to do exploitation is already there on the host. If I can live off the land and go native and use things that ship with the operating system or that are already there in the environment, why would I want to use any other tools? Um, I'm sure every, do I have any pen testers and red teamers in here? I assume so. So I'm, I'm sure everyone has their own custom tool set, but the more you use your custom tool set, the sooner it's going to get burned and it's not going to work anymore. So if you have open source or freely available um, native tools that can accomplish the same goals, use those first. Save your specialized tool set for when the native things just don't work. Um, additionally, PowerShell is, I don't know, I drink the PowerShell Kool-Aid by the gallon. I drink so much IP blue. It's really good Kool-Aid. Um, PowerShell can do just about anything. Uh, with its direct access to the .NET framework, in addition to its full ability to control WMI, I mean, if you can't do it with .NET and WMI, it doesn't need to be done. You can do anything. You just have to be a little creative about how to do it. So pretty much everything that's going to be covered in this talk is going to leverage a similar concept, and that is to um, basically create a new COM object uh, that is going to be um, Microsoft's Outlook. Uh, so we're going to be creating a new object. It's not going to be pointing to it. It's not a pointer to an object. It's not a reference to it. It is going to be creating the actual .NET object for Microsoft Outlook. Um, it is an important thing to note that anytime you do this, if Outlook is not already running, guess what it's going to do? It's going to start Outlook, and someone's going to notice that Outlook opens up on their desktop without them clicking anything. So if Outlook's not already running in the environment, you might want to, when you call the object, do it, tack is visible, false, so that it doesn't start up Outlook in the person's face. Instead, sets it in the background. If Outlook is already running, though, you do not want to do is visible, false, or the Outlook will disappear. Um, so just things to keep in mind. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at, we're going to start out with some data mining from there, go on to some client side, some triggering techniques, and then finally wrap up with the bare bones basics of automation. Um, so for data mining, everything that's in Outlook, it views it all as just folders. Uh, so your inbox, your contacts, your tasks, all those things are just different folders. And as long as we know what the folder number is that holds those objects, we can tell Outlook to grab those particular items in that folder, i.e. the contacts or tasks or calendar, and display them to us. 
Um, it works for every single folder. So anything that's in Outlook, anything that's stored in there. So if you get onto, you know, the CEO of the company's computer, it's going to be everything that you need to know about the company. Um, if it's stored in Outlook, we have access to grab it. So let me just go to the code real quick and we will take a peek at this. Um, I designed this and this is all rough proof of concept code. Please do not take it and use it in an engagement without thoroughly testing it yourself. Um, everything does functionally work, but it's not necessarily the most OPSEC friendly at the current moment in time. It is all on GitHub, though, and the link will be on the end of the slides. If you want to grab it and download it, you're more than welcome to branch it, do whatever you want with it. Um, so I set this up to pull, by default, the inbox, but you can throw switches on there to tell it what you want it to grab. Um, another great thing about writing tools in PowerShell, if you get the ISE open like this and you do Control-J, you can make a commandlet template that populates your help menu for you, and then you just have to fill out the blank, and your tool has full help support. What? That's crazy. All right. So again, the, I just made a simple function. It's called get Outlook, and it's just going to data mine that Outlook. Whatever the current user that whose token you have, it'll start their Outlook and strip the information out of it. Um, by default, it does the inbox, but you can throw in a switch to have it go to the send items folder, calendars, contacts, tasks, um, and we'll get to the full switch in just a second. All right. So it's just a bunch of if statements that say if the switch calendar was there, set the folder to be the Outlook folder that matches the calendar. Um, and if it's contacts, switch to the contacts, so on and so forth. Down here, what we're going to do is, so if it's pulling emails, it first it grabs the target folder that holds the emails. It's going to populate them up and store them in a variable. Once they're stored in that variable, it's if the full switch has been given, it's going to give you the full email. When I say the full email, I don't mean the body. I mean the full email. All the metadata from the senders to, has anyone ever looked at the full metadata of an email? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. A one-line email will produce this much information. So I put a little disclaimer on there to stop you from running the full, you know, to let you know, hey, this is going to be a, a really big thing you're making. Are you sure you want to do this? Um, pardon? Yep. Yeah, it'll, lottie dotty everybody, it'll scrap, scrape the whole shebang. Whatever's there, it's going to grab. Okay, that is big enough. Um, so if you do say yes, that you're all right with scraping it, then it'll grab everything. Otherwise, it cancels and reverts to the standard output, which is just a little table that shows you the sender's name, the subject line, and the first line of the body. Um... Uh, and that's about all there is to the code. It's a pretty simple little program. Um, man down. So I am going to, I thought about live demoing this, but um, it turns out having a domain controller, an exchange server, and two workstations running to do a demo, um, it kind of killed my laptop. That's more juice than, I, I ran out of RAM basically. So I ended up recording videos to cover all of the items. Come on. There she goes. All right, so like any PowerShell module, you have to import it before you can use it. You can do this with the direct path, or if you had put it to in the modules folder on the target, then you can just import it. If you're doing this in target space, though, you probably don't want to start populating the modules directory of their PowerShell. They don't need your tools. So if I type get Outlook by itself, it just pulled a summary listing of the emails so you could see if there was anything in there that was worthwhile. If you do the full, it again says, are you sure you want to do this? Because it's going to be really, really big. Sure, there's only four emails. We can pull the full. So you can see it literally, it does. It scrapes everything about the email. So. If there's anything you ever wanted to know about email metadata, have at it and it will scrape it for you. Um, if you wanted to, I think the next thing I do is I go after the contacts. Nope, it scrapes the sent folder. So if you put the sent switch, it switches to the sent folder. If you uh, 
put uh, contacts, again, it'll switch to contacts, tasks, and calendar as well. So I only had one thing on the calendar. I just populated one event so that there would be something there to display. Um, but it will scrape whatever you want it to grab. Um, thought the video went a little faster than this. All right, so now it's going to go and grab contacts. And again, it's just changed the switch to contacts, and it's going to grab what I consider to be the relative and important fields out of contacts. Um, if you wanted any additional fields, um, just modify the script, put the name of the field in there, and it'll grab it. Yes? That will only be the contacts that that user has saved. So it's not going to be, it's not scraping like the global catalog or anything. It's just anything that they've entered into that contacts field manually. Um, so yeah, you know that section that no one ever uses? I figured why not get everything while I was at it. I only have it set to grab the primary inbox. Um, if you wanted to grab like uh, the PSD files, if they're already mapped to Outlook, you would just need to look up what that folder number is. So everything's assigned a folder. I think junk is, I think, 23. Inbox is, I want to say, 6. So you just have to find what the number is that's assigned to each box and then tell it to do that particular item. Yes? It is standardized um, as far as the default boxes. So like junk, sent, inbox, those are always going to be the same. Once someone starts adding new folders, it's going to be assigned whatever number it gets assigned. Um, I'm not sure what the rhyme or reason is to what number it gets, but I, it'll pick something that's unused. All right, so let's move on to the gloriousness of client side. Now, anyone familiar with spam confidence levels, SCLs? So anytime an email gets sent, Exchange looks at it and it says, okay, what is the likelihood that this is going to be spam? If it's sent from internal to the network, it's considered a trusted email, and it gets a spam confidence level of minus one. Anything minus one is going to get delivered to the inbox, period, no matter what. Um, after that, if it's zero, it's going to go to the inbox. If it's set up at, I think it's right around three, it trips the threshold for junk, and it will go to the junk mail folder instead of going to your inbox. The other ones that are there by default are delete and reject. The only difference between delete and reject is whether or not the sender gets notified that their email was deleted. Um, so if you send a email that has an executable attached and a link into it and it's coming from a Nigerian prince who wants to send you money to a bank account and sell you Viagra at a great price on the side, you're probably going to hit an SCL of 9 and it's just going to get deleted and never touch the disk. Um, so just everything that you do to an email can increase its SCL. Uh, especially if you add any attachment that has executable functionality. So that includes a PowerShell script or an XE file or a batch file. Anything that can execute, it increases the SCL. Anytime you put a link inside of an email, it increases the SCL a little bit. So knowing where the SCL threshold is and what's going to happen to your particular email can be very beneficial. So disclaimer, this isn't actually using... Outlook, it's technically using Exchange, but I'm still going to count it. Um, so PowerShell has a built-in commandlet. Uh, it's not available on standard PowerShell. It's only on PowerShell for Exchange. So if you get onto an Exchange server, you can open up the PowerShell there, and there's this great little commandlet called new transport rule. So you can put a new transport rule. This will be transparent to the user. The only person that will see it is someone who has access to the Exchange server who can look at transport rules. Um, so in the first one, I just made new transport rule, named it whatever, set SCL. Anything coming from my email address, I want to set the SCL to be minus one if it goes to my target. So now I can send him executable files, and they will not go to the junk folder. They'll go to the inbox. What's the great benefit of that? When anything goes to the junk folder, every executable code gets disabled so it won't run. 
and all the links get killed. So it's really hard to client side someone if they can't click on any of your stuff. Um, so you would already have to be in the network for this because you'd have to be on the exchange server. But once you are, you can put that SCL rule in place and it will modify the spam confidence level for anything coming from your attacking email. Um, make sure you put a from email as well as your target. You don't want to just put it the target's email address or every piece of spam is going to go to his inbox and you'll get caught real fast. Um, there's other things you can do. Uh, the bottom example, this new transport rule named BCC, anything sent to that user, the exchange server is going to blind carbon copy it in the background to me. So now maybe I don't need to get in the network. Maybe I just want to get this guy's email and everything that he gets sent to him, it's going to come to me too. Now, ta-da, I won and I didn't even have to go anywhere. I love not having to leave the house. All right, I'm going to go on time. Okay, we're in good shape. So now we're going to get to some of the more fun things. We're going to dig into where I think Outlook can really shine. I mean, think about it, what is... A backdoor is a wonderful thing. Exploitation makes a mess, it's a pain in the butt, and sometimes it can do bad things to boxes, so I try to not exploit any more than I have to. Every backdoor has a pro and a con, right? You've got to, at the end of the day, it either has to bind a socket or it has to call out. So you've either got a beacon, which is probably preferred these days, which generates unnecessary network traffic, or you've got something that's holding a bloody socket open on the host and can be defeated by netstat. Um, I never use a bind shell anymore. Ideally, you want something that has the best of both worlds. You want something that's going to call out, but only when it receives a specific trigger. There is nothing that makes a better triggering mechanism than email. I mean, think about the very nature of how email works. You have something that's designed to take random information from the internet and put it on the target host. That sounds like a triggering mechanism to me if I ever heard one. So we're just going to take advantage of that natural functionality that exists in Outlook to take data from the outside and deliver it into the network, and we're going to use it to carry our triggers in. Okay, quick disclaimer. This is not a persistence mechanism. This is only a triggering mechanism. You're still going to need something to start your PowerShell script, and what you use for that, I mean, you can go old school, use the registry or a service, or you can go new school and use PowerShell to register a permanent WMI event that starts your pay, starts your script as soon as the box boots, whatever suits your particular fancy. What we're generally going to do, you'll have to already have a payload that it's going to call. Um, I have it just pointing to an executable payload, so I have it pop a calculator because I guess that's what you're supposed to do with proof of concept code. Um, if you wanted to run a script instead, I could have taken shell code and instead of having it start an executable file, I could have just put in there shell code equals and then give my string and then invoke shell code, um, which would have started the shell code native in the script, but it's harder to show. It's really easy to see a calculator start. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to monitor the inbox for a particular trigger email. As soon as it receives that email, it's going to start the payload, and then as soon as it starts the payload, it's going to go back and clean up all the evidence from the, um, from the email. So it'll delete the email and then remove it from the deleted items folder as well so that the evidence of your trigger is gone. Um, at that point, it's going to sleep for a designated interval because you don't want it constantly, you know, pooling the box or someone's going to notice that, you know, 80% of their RAM is being used up by PowerShell and Outlook, which is not fishy at all. Yes? I'm sorry? I don't have it doing that, I don't believe, but you could. I don't know, if you delete it out of the lead them items folder, does it still live in the recovery? So you have to delete it three times? So no, I do not have it going there. I, uh, 
never even occurred to me. I just rolled with the thought that if I deleted I deleted items, it's gone. Well, so that would be for version 2.0. We will uh, put in that added little step. Okay. So for this one, the code gets a little more complicated. This I don't think this is a hundred lines. It's a little more. Um, so what it does, for the email to be the trigger, it has to come from a specified email address and have a specified subject line. It doesn't matter what's in the body, it's just looking for those two things. So when you start your script running, you have to let it know what that email address is going to be, um, that you're going to be coming from, and what the, uh, there's a party over there, uh, what the uh, subject line is going to be. If either one of the things doesn't match, it will not trigger. Um, by default, it monitors the uh, inbox, but I did throw a switch in there that you can have it monitor the junk folder instead. Maybe you don't want emails to be popping up all the time saying that a sender sent an email, especially since we're going to be deleting them, and it's kind of weird if you get a pop-up that says, hey, you've got an email, and then you look in the email and it's not there. Um, people notice that after a while. So maybe you would want to put a transport rule in that sets your SCL to automatically go to the junk folder. I don't need any execution here, I just need it to see the email. So maybe you would want to do that, use the junk folder instead, nobody ever gets a pop-up, life's good, and honestly, who looks at their damn junk folder anyways? So, so the deleted items folder is folder number three, uh, the junk folder is 23, and the inbox is six. So I lied and was completely wrong about the folder numbers before I had them all switched up. That's why there's the internet, so we can look these things up. So what it's going to do is, similar to what it, the last one did, it's going to create a new com object that is uh, Microsoft Outlook. Um, it's then going to set the folder to whatever folder we told it, junk or inbox. And then it's going to grab all the items that are in that folder, i.e. the emails, and save them in a variable called emails. It's then going to take those emails one at a time and pass them across to the for each. Uh, it's short for for each object. So it'll look at each email individually. And if the email's sender email address matches the sender mail or sender email that we set in the script, and if the subject matches the trigger subject, then the first thing we do is we set it to the unread field. We set that to false so it doesn't stick out as much in the inbox. So it looks like something they already looked at. Um, we then start process for whatever we designated the payload to be. Assume it's probably a reverse TCP payload that's just going to call back out. Um, at that point, it sets a variable called cleaned to false, because it's going to have to do the same process of looking through all the emails in the deleted items folder as well. I don't want it to do that every time if it hasn't gotten a trigger email, because that's just going to burn RAM for no reason. So as long as the clean variable is set to false, it's going to try to clean up. As soon as it switches it back to true, it stops the cleanup part and only monitors. That way we reduce our RAM usage by about 45% for the script overall. All right. So it deleted the email, set the clean to false. After that, if cleaned is set to false, then it goes through the following items. So it deletes it out of the deleted items folder, um, and then it sets the clean variable to true. Uh, with the clean variable being true, this logic will not hit again until we get another trigger. Uh, after that, it's going to go into its sleep cycle. So the sleep is in seconds. Uh, you have to be careful with the sleep cycle. If you set it to too long, the emails, your trigger is going to sit there for a hot minute, and it's likely to be noticed. If you set it to too short, though, it's going to just scan constantly, and again, it's going to start to burn up RAM. And... I mean, it's not a horrible burn, but it, if you set that to like two or three seconds, you can see the RAM load for the process getting up to about 25%, which is a little bit heavy, because think about it, it's a while loop that's running forever and constantly scanning every single email. It, it gets a little resource intensive. All right. Okay, so just like before, we're going to have to import the module. Once it's loaded, life should be good. Um, so 
I have the trigger in the junk, uh, in the junk folder at the moment, so that it should scan and not see the trigger email. And then when I move it to the inbox, it should see it, trigger off of it, and call back. So the new Outlook trigger, we'll set it with the sender email of baduser at malware.com. Um, you can send all these. There's a send mail message commandlet that lets you send emails to anybody as anybody. I sent job offers to my coworkers from M. Zuckerberg at fb.com. Uh, it was hilarious. Um, he almost quit. <laughs> but we're going to set it with the email, and the trigger subject to trigger, and the payload is just going to be a calculator, and I set the delay to two, and then I tell it verbose. So all those lines that said write verbose, those don't do anything unless you run the command with a verbose switch, in which case it displays it. So it's searching, sleeping, searching, sleeping. It's just spinning through, and as soon as I move this email over, it shouldn't take long for it to, there we go. So it, it goes through it pretty quick. Obviously, it'll take a little longer if there's a lot of emails in the inbox because it has to look at each and every one of them. All right. All right. So the one problem that you're really going to have here, though, is what does your trigger have to be every time? That same sender's email address with the same subject line. So first off, at a certain point, someone's going to see the email and then see that it disappears. That's not normal. They might write it off once. About the second or third time, though, they're going to call the admin and say something's really wrong here. Um, additionally, we're bound to that one email address, so we might want to have some variety. Um, so my thought process was, what if we took an email that was completely benign? that a person gets all the time, and we just didn't delete it. Who here has a LinkedIn page? Yeah. Who here gets damn emails with BS job offers from some recruiter on LinkedIn like once a week? So you don't think anything of them, right? You just delete them and move on? What if that could be our trigger email? That's the thought process I went to, is to have a LinkedIn email be our trigger email. So we're going to make it dynamic. So rather than filtering on the subject line or the email addresses at all, we're going to use the body of the email. And not only is our email uh, trigger going to be able to be dynamic, but also the port that it calls out to and the IP address. All of that will be inside the body of the email. And we're going to do it in a way that it's not going to look suspicious. The email is going to look like a legitimate damn recruiter spamming you trying to give you a LinkedIn job offer. So what we're going to need is three trigger words. You want to make sure your trigger words are generic enough that they don't look weird. You know, you don't want to have word of the day toilet paper words in your email. You know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious or anything that's going to seem strange. You want it to be common enough words that are going to blend in. On the other hand, you need to make sure the three words are unlikely to show up in a regular email, because they might actually get an email from a LinkedIn person. We don't want their email triggering our payload. Customers don't like that. Um, additionally, it's going to have to have a single number in it that falls within the port range. Uh, the final thing we're going to need is we're going to put a URL in there that's going to resolve to our callback IP address. Um, so you'll have to have a payload here. I'd use just like MSFNM or something to prep a payload that doesn't have a callback IP or port, but that requires these parameters be specified. It's not that hard to do, and that way we can have the same payload call back to a different IP address every time we get on. So you didn't see that. So the way we're going to do this, um, I put a little bit of parameter control in here. Um, so I have a validate count to make sure that there's exactly three trigger words supplied. Uh, you also have to tell it the delay and what the payload is. And I left in that switch to monitor the junk folder if you wanted. Um, other than that, everything will be in the body of the email. So we're just defining the folders again, starting that same com object that we started every other time. And so here's what we do. Those uh, trigger words that will be supplied by the user when they, or by us when we start the script, they're stored in an array, so we'll just call them by our position in the trigger words array. 
So if the body of the email matches trigger words zero and trigger words one and trigger words two, so if it hits on all three of our trigger words, it's then going to process that email to figure out what it's supposed to call back to. Um, I can thank a coworker for this regex because Cole doesn't do regex. Regex and I do not get along. We agreed to disagree a long time ago. But I assure you that top one is the regex for a URL. The bottom one, which is ridiculously long, is the regex for a number that falls within the legitimate port range. God, I hate regex. Okay. So what we did is we took the body of the email, and here we have a variable called formatted that equals the body of the email split on every space. So essentially I took this big paragraph of an email and I broke it into a long array of words. So we can look at each word individually to see if it matches our regex. Um, so for each section in formatted, so for each single little block of characters between spaces, um, if the section matches, we're selecting the string uh, that matches the pattern for our URL regex, if it matches that, um, it'll save it in that variable, and if that does not equal null, then we're defining that as our URL. We're then doing the same thing. We're going through and checking to see if it matches our port regex, and if so, we're saving it as our port. We then, I just have a couple of verbose statements so I could troubleshoot it and make sure it was doing what I thought it was doing. We're then going to try a DNS, uh, we're just going to get a, a DNS lookup on the URL. Um, and once it's done, we are going to set that IP address. We're going to convert it into a string that can be fed to our payload and have it kick off and do what we want it to do. Um, and then I took out the part that would actually start the payload, and instead I have it echo what it would trigger on and send it into a text document, because that's easier for a demo than trying to do Wireshark and capture PCAP to show what it called out to. Um, and... After that, it's just going to start sleep for the random delay and then come back to the beginning. So the benefit of this, again, is that you don't have to worry about anybody finding the email. You'll notice there's no cleanup there. I'm not going to delete the email. I'm going to leave it sitting there. As long as I'm not triggering onto the box three times a week, no one's going to notice that one extra email each week that is just crap email. They might forward it on. Uh, to IT and say, hey, one got past the spam filter, but that's fine because they're just going to filter it based on the sender's IP address that I'm not using anyways. So I'll just pick a different one for the next one. All right, so I went ahead for the IP address. I just used my works email, so chirontech.com. Um, and for my trigger words, I chose LinkedIn independent and cyber tax security because they all seem normal. I figured putting the TAC in cyber security would make it my one that would be hard for somebody else to match because who the hell hyphenates cyber security? Except for maybe a, a bad LinkedIn recruiter who I'm trying to emulate. So there's our email. It's got the three trigger words in it. It's got the uh, company URL in there. And the best part is, what has the same number of possible digits as a port? Street numbers. What's in everybody's signature block? Oh yeah, their work address. So I just made a BS work address and whatever that street number is, that's the port I'm going to call out to. Um, so you can see that Chiron Tech is 208, 113, whatever, it'll pop it up a second. So we're starting it, it's looking for those three trigger words and it's just going to start notepad and resolve to Chiron Tech and port 2700 because that's our street address, I believe. So. Searching, it's searching, it's not finding anything. So I'm going to take my email. Come on, there we go. And we're going to take our email, move it to the inbox, so now it should catch it and trigger on it. Give it a second. All right, it says it found the URL, it discovered the URL. So now the payload will call out to 208.113.173.2 uh, on port 2700. Um, that's the port we wanted, and that's the IP address we wanted because it matches the one I was intending to have a call out to. Um, yay. Uh, okay. 
So what's the only thing that's better than a good triggerable backdoor? What if you don't have to get on the box at all? There's some tasks that you're going to have to do, you're going to have to get on the box to do. You just, that's the nature of the beast. Sometimes, though, it's just sort of sustained collection, and you already know what directory you want to scrape or what information you're going to want to grab. You just have to wait for it to show up. Um, so if you already know what commands you would run when you got on the box, do you really have to get on the box, or do you just have to email a script? I went with email a script. So, I mean, Outlook takes messages in. It also sends messages back out. So why not send our script via an email, have it load the script, execute it and run it for us, and then output the results to a text file that it saves as an attachment and emails back to us. That sounds awesome. It sounds like I don't have to work as much. Okay. You can't just email a PS1 script. It doesn't work that way. Um, it makes Outlook very suspicious. It will get your email kicked to the junk folder, and it just looks like bad juju. Um, the great part is PowerShell doesn't care if it's a PowerShell script or just a series of commands that are fed to it. So if you just change your PowerShell extension dot, dot .txt, it's now a text file. It's no longer executable code. Outlook doesn't give a damn, doesn't pop any flags, and PowerShell can still process the commands just fine. You can take them and feed it to it, and it'll kick off beautifully. All right. So, I like how it says the steps are fairly simple, and then there's a big long list of steps. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to monitor for that trigger email again. Um, I left it dynamic, but you could set it to static if you were always going to come from the same one. Once it gets detected, it's going to save the attachment temporarily to disk. I'm sure there's a way to scrape it, store it in memory, and have it processed properly, but I only tried to get it to work for about an hour, and then I got angry and just saved it to disk and solved the problem. It's going to be on disk for literally a second, and it's a text document. They're not going to find it, and even if they do, they won't have time to open it before it goes away. Um, so once it's detected, it'll save the attachment temporarily to disk. Um, I believe I put it in the temp directory, and it's called tilde df string of gibberish that there's always eight of in there anyways, so it'll blend in beautifully. Um, once it writes it to disk, it's going to save its contents as a variable and then delete it off the disk. So again, it's going to be there for a fraction of a second. It's then going to take that uh, contents that's in that variable, which is our script, and it's going to run the script and then save the output to another temp file. This one has to be a file because it's really hard to add a in-memory attachment. It doesn't work that way. Um, so it will then take those results and it's going to email them back to whatever email address sent them the trigger. It's going to save that email address as a variable and when it has the contents done, it will then send it back to whoever sent the trigger in. So, yay. It'll then delete the trigger and the exfil emails and clean both emails out of the deleted items folder. Um, all right, so most of this is going to look really familiar. Again, we're just creating that new com object, setting our folders, specifying our trigger words to catch on. At that point, it saves um, the sender email address, because it has to be saved later so it knows where to send the response back to. It's then going to grab that email and look at its attachments. And for the attachment, it's going to take it, save it to the current user's environment in the temp folder as df whatever.txt. It's then going to save it as a variable and then blow away the text file. Uh, it's then going to run PowerShell with the command of whatever saved in that script. So again, a big long script, it could be a thousand lines of code. As long as it's fed to PowerShell uh, via a variable, it'll take it and run it, and it doesn't count as a script either, it, so it bypasses the script execution policy without having to put a bypass. It's then going to take the results and put them out to the same temp folder with a slightly different gibberish. Um, it then defines that as a file, and it's going to have Outlook create a new item and set the subject and the body. After I wrote all this, I realized it probably would have been easier to just use the send mail message commandlet to send the email back out with an attachment, and I could have done it in one line instead of ten. More notes for version two. 
and then it's going to do its typical cleanup. All right. So I didn't pick anything. Um, where's the bloody thing? I know it's right in front of my face. Oh, it's right there. Okay, so I didn't have it do anything super exciting. Um, I commented out the section that would clean up the emails and the script for the demo because, well, I, you wouldn't be able to see that it sent the email if it deleted it and cleaned it up. So I commented that out so that the evidence would still be there. Um, the script I sent isn't overly complicated. I went with something simple. I just have it pull a running process list. Um, my three trigger words were kitty, dog, and cheeky because I didn't feel like writing another long email at this point. Um, and again, the email just has the get process commandlet. So it's going to run, get a list of the running processes, save it to disk, attach it to a new email that it sends out. Now you're going to notice something a little different is going to happen on this one, and it's going to make a bunch of pop-ups. And we will discuss those pop-ups momentarily. Um, they're supposed to happen. So it, there's a workaround so that the user doesn't actually have to click, yes, let something take over my Outlook. Um, so that would make our tool not so useful. All right. So it's searching. It doesn't see a trigger email. We move it to the inbox. It should fairly quickly. Yeah, there's that little pop-up. It says, oh, something's trying to access one of your emails. Do you want to allow this to happen? I said, yes, let it do it. Okay, it found the email. It did all the processing. And now it says, wait a minute. Something else is trying to send an email as you. Do you want to allow this? So we're going to just tell it yes to let it process. Um, but then we will discuss the workaround. So it should have sent an email now. And so if we look in the send items, there's our email. If we open up the email, and we open up the email, there we go and open the attachment, it should be a process listing. Yay! So it did roughly what we wanted it to do. All right, so things that I would like to improve on. There's no encryption in this really at the moment, so everything's going to be sent in the clear. Uh, customers don't tend to like that, so I would probably add some form of encryption for customer data before I send it out to the internet. Um, I'd also like to get it all into one script, just have one mega script that did everything. Um, but that's a down the road. And again, I want to put in a switch to check, see if Outlook is running. And if so, let it run normal. And if it's not, to tell it to start it with it not being visible. Those are the only main additions. And apparently deleting an email a third time should probably go in the list as well. Okay, so I always hate when people give talks and they're like, here's this cool thing that can own systems, and then doesn't tell you anything about how to protect against it. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. So here's how you can protect yourself. For starters, use a less crappy antivirus product. So um, you, those pop-ups in the last demo, the reason those pop-ups were there is that box didn't have an antivirus product running. As soon as a AV product registers certain changes take place. So Outlook naturally protects itself. That's what those pop-ups are. It's like, wait, this doesn't seem quite right. Are you sure you want to allow this to happen? It's good. It's what it's supposed to do. As soon as an antivirus product registers and it shows up in uh, root, simv2, uh, security center2, I believe is the namespace it gets registered in. As soon as something registers there, Outlook says, oh, I don't have to protect myself anymore. There's an AV here. Surely those are well coded. So it assumes that the antivirus product is actually checking emails, which, as you can see, I think the one that we used was Komodo, which did a horrible job. Um, so I wouldn't, a lot of people say kill AVs, get rid of AVs. No, you, you need to have AVs, but you need to have one that doesn't suck. Maybe stop using the cheap one or the free one and actually pay a little bit of money for something that's supposed to be protecting you. Um, other than that, event logs. Event logs are absolutely your friend. It has never been easier to be a defender than it is today. Um, I mean, just three years ago, it was so much harder to be a defender. Uh, the Windows event logs have improved tenfold. 
Um, so for starters, you need to obviously be auditing process creation, and you should probably notice when PowerShells are starting. Um, PowerShell has its own logging. It should be used and turned on beyond what it's set to by default, which is basically PowerShell started, PowerShell stopped. There's other auditing events that can be turned on there. Um, if you have Windows 7 or newer and you have the right security patch installed, how many defenders do I have in here? Red teamers don't count as defenders. Okay. Do you know if your networks have command line included in their event logs? So if you just have process creation logged, the event log is going to say, PowerShell.exe started. If you include the command line and it's just checking one little box, it'll say PowerShell tack encoded command and then the big blob of base64 code that you can switch back that shows exactly what the attacker did. I mean, it's insanely powerful. Anything that's done remotely is done via the command line. So every single argument and option that gets passed is going to be written in that event log if you just check the one damn box. Uh, it's going to take up a little more storage, but what's a one terabyte hard drive these days? Like 80 bucks? I don't think we any longer have the argument that, well, it takes storage. Buy more storage. It's not expensive. Um, PowerShell also has mandatory transcription. So there's a command lit that started in PowerShell version 4. So if you're running Windows 7, this part is not going to work. But if you're running Windows 10, it's got PowerShell version 5 by default, this will work. There's a start transcript commandlet that records everything you type and everything that's returned to a text file. Well, there's an auditing setting that makes transcription mandatory. So it doesn't even tell the user it's doing it, but it records everything that they type and everything that's returned and saves it off to a text file. So and that's only things that are typed in PowerShell. So if you have someone using malicious PowerShell in your network, you will see every single thing that they typed. All right, so my obligatory shout outs. So for Git Outlook, um, there was a scripting guy article about exporting your calendar information. That's what gave me the idea to scrape Outlook. So I borrowed that from him. Um, Matt Nelson came up with the original trigger script for the email. So not the dynamic one, but the standard trigger. The one I have is very close to the one that he has on that exact web page right there. I just added some extra cleanup. I deleted the emails instead of just leaving them in, in the deleted items folder. I cleaned up there, marked them as unread. A couple other little tweaks. But I have to give him a shout out for that because other than that, he wrote most of that general code. Um, if you do want to have any of the code samples to tinker with, play with, have fun with, what have you, they are on GitHub at that address. And that is all. I can put that back. Yes. To be able to create what? Oh, a com object? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe you'll. I mean, you create objects all the time as a regular user. You shouldn't need to be administrator. You should be able to do it as a default user. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you could. Um, I thought about putting it in the body of the email. Problem is, I figured that would then be forever. Every script that I made would be on the Exchange server if someone noticed. If they started to notice behavior and they started digging, an email with no content in it that is somehow 3K can be a little fishy. Throw it in? Yeah. Ooh. You can do that, but if you have content and commands, it would be, you'd have to do some funky juju to tell it where to find commands. Yeah, you'd have to put something in there or say, cut it off at this trigger word and below that word is your commands and scrape just that. But yes, that could absolutely be done. You can, unless it's a user like me who always does shift delete, in which case it'll never go to the deleted items folder. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I always give way too much credit to the competence of the average American workforce. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can do it. Um, I mean, part of it, I mean, you'd be using this for some form of, like, CTE action, some red team, some cyber threat emulation. How far you go, I guess, depends on who you're trying to emulate. I mean, it's, it's red teaming's not pen testing. It's, you're supposed to be emulating some form of attack. And depending on your sophistica uh, sophistication level you're trying to emulate, make it a little harder, make it a little easier. But you absolutely could do that as well. Yes? Constrained language mode pretty much breaks everything. Um, however, it also seems to piss off admins that use PowerShell and scripts for administration. So it's one of those things that, yeah, it will, it will, I would almost guarantee that it would break this. I don't know that for a fact, but I believe it would break this. I just haven't found many places that have that because then the admins can't do their stuff either. And we'll always take accessibility over security. Any other questions? Bueller? All right, yes. To run a new transport rule? Yeah. Since you have to run that command on the Exchange server, any account that you got on there would have the privileges to add that transport rule. Assuming that, okay, I might be giving too much credit to the users again. I'm assuming that your regular users don't have login permissions on your Exchange server. <laughs> um, any account that's on the Exchange server should be able to put the transport rules in place. Because if you're not an admin, you should have no business being on the Exchange server. Um, but whether a regular user could do it, I never thought to try. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for dealing with me.